as a man thinketh. James Allen, 1904. Introduction. There is genius, power, and magic in this book. As you think, has been proven to be one of the world's most enduring and best self-help books in the best sense of term, self-empowerment is a better term, or self-actualization. This little book shows us that we are capable of greatness and gives us the tools to achieve it. The truth can always be stated simply, and when it is stated, it can have a powerful effect. It can change our lives, in fact. The truth can literally make us free from the limitations that we have imposed upon ourselves. James Allen shows us so clearly that the key to personal power is in our minds. And he shows us how to use this key to unlock the greatest successes and fulfillment that we can imagine. I discovered as you think about 20 years ago, and it has been my constant companion ever since. It is the single most powerful book that I have ever read, and it has changed my life. I have read dozens of times and read it dozens of times. I often pick it up, and it's often... I open it at a randomness when I feel and I need to when I need inspiration. And as simple as the brilliant words of James Allen has seeped low slowly into my subconscious of my life, he has steadily changed it for the better. And I no longer do any things that I don't want to do in my life and I spend my time doing what I love. I have discovered my vocation, mission, purpose in life, and I have dreamed my successes and fulfillments, and I have realized my dreams. The words by James Allen, who is no relation to me incidentally, have been powerful and have been a powerful guide in my force in my force of life and I am grateful to be able to share these with you and I have edited this book only slightly changed the words from here and there to have more become obsolete and have comes to mean of difference the original title as a man thinketh of course the author meant women as well as men for the principles he points us out to is clearly our universal applying to everyone regardless of sex age race belief or social standing or education I don't know if James Allen was aware of the Buddhist tradition or not, though the content of his thinking is very possible that he had studied Eastern as well as the Western wisdom. Buddha taught 2,500 years ago that there are eight great paths of liberation and serenity, to which James Allen puts it out on page 76, a spiritual world of stainless beauty and perfect peace. The paths are right understanding, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right aspiration, right mindfulness, and right meditation. As You Think is a brilliant summary of the path of the right thinking. It certainly touches us in several of the other paths as well. Of course, it is certainly possible that James Allen came to his great level of understanding entirely through the Western traditions and through his own meditation. Very little is known about him as far as that I know that no one knows the sources of his tremendous insight and guidance. This book opens up with a short poem, Mind is a Master, Powerful. M Mind is the master, powerful, that molds and makes. In Tibetan Buddhism, books always open with a short poem or tradition that, can understand the, that you can understand the poem. And you don't need to read the book because the poem contains all the wisdom within the book. It is true as well as within you as, as you think, understanding the opening poem, and that you have grasped the essence of this book and found the key to fulfillment and a key that you can unlock your genius, power, and magic and enjoy the gift James Allen has given us. In a small package, he has wrapped a timeless, immeasurable treasure. Mark Allen, Novato, California. As a man thinketh, as you think, mind is the master power that molds and makes, and we are mind. And evermore we take the tools of thought in shaping what we will. Bring forth a thousand joys, a thousand ills. We think in secret, and it comes to pass. Our world is but our looking glass. James Allen This little volume, the result of meditation and experience, is not intended as an exhaustive treatise on the much-written-upon subject of the power of thought. It is suggestive rather than explanatory. Its object being is to stimulate men and women to discover in perceptions of the truth that they themselves are makers of themselves by virtue of thoughts and they choose and encourage that mind is master is a master weaver both of the inner garment of character and the outer garment of their circumstances in that as they may have previously woven in ignorance and pain they may now weave in enlightenment and happiness James Allen Invercombe England 1 thought and character as being of power, intelligence, love, you hold the key to every situation and contain within yourself that transforming and regenerative agency by which you may make yourself what you will. The aphorism, as we think in our hearts, so are we, not only embraces the whole of our being, but it is so comprehensive to each out to every condition and circumstances of our lives that we are literally what we think, our character being the complete sum of all our thoughts. As we plant springs from, it could not be without the seeds, so that every one of our acts springs from the hidden seeds of our thoughts. And it could not have appeared without them, or appeared without them, that this applies equally to those acts called spontaneous and unpremeditated, as to those that are deliberately executed. Act is the blossom of thought, and the joy of sufferings is our fruits. Thus do we gather in our sweet and bitter fruits of our own planning. 
that we are designed and built by our own thoughts in our mind, that if we nurture ignorant or evil thoughts, pain will soon follow. If our thoughts are healthy and beneficial, joy will follow us, and surely as the shadow follows us on a sunny day. A man or woman is growth by law, not by creation or artifice. In such cause and effect as an absolute and undeviating in the hidden realm of thoughts as the world is visible in material things. A noble and godlike character is not only a thing of favor and chance, but it is a natural result of continued effort in right thinking. The effort of long cherished association with godlike thoughts is ignorable and bestial character, but at the same time it is the result of continued harboring and groveling thoughts. We are made of unmade by ourselves, and we are made or unmade by ourselves. In this armory of thought, we forge the weapons that we use to destroy ourselves, and we also fashion the tools from which we'll build ourselves heavenly mansions of joy and strength and peace. And by that right of choices and true applications of our thoughts, we ascend to divine perfection. By the abuses and wrong applications of our thoughts, we descend below the level of beast or between the two extremes of all grades of character, and we are there, makers and masters." of all the beautiful truths pertaining to the soul that we have been restored and brought into the light, that this age, none is more gladdening or fruitful or divine promise or confidence than this. And you are the master of your thought, the molder of your character, and the maker and shaper of your condition, environment, and destiny. And as being in power of an intelligence and love, the lord of your own thoughts, and you hold the key to every situation and contain with yourself that transforming and regenerative agency by which you make yourself what you will. You are always the master. Even in your weakest and most abandoned state, you're still the master. But in your weakest and degenerations, you are still the foolish master who misgoverns your household. When you begin to reflect upon your condition, to the search di di diligently for the law upon from which your being is established, then you will become wise and a master, directing your energies with intelligence and fashioning your thoughts with fruitful issues, such as a conscious master. You can only become a conscious master by discovering within yourself the laws of thought, the discovery of totally and matter of application, self-analysis, and experience, only by which searching and mining or gold of diamonds obtained that you could find every truth connecting with your being. If you will dig deep into the mind of your soul, the fact is, is that you are the maker of your character, the molder of your life, and the builder of your destiny, and you may unerringly prove if you will watch, control, and alter your thoughts, tracing the effects upon yourself and upon others and upon your life and circumstances, linking cause and effect by patient practice and investigation, and utilizing your every experience, even the most trivial, everyday occurrence as a means of obtaining that knowledge of yourself that leads to understanding wisdom and power. In this direction, as in no other, is the law of absolute. Those that seek shall find. Those that knock on the door, that door shall be opened. For only by patience, practice, ceaseless opportunity, ceasing and ceaseless importunity, can you enter the door of the temple of knowledge. 2. The Effect of Thought on Circumstances the human will that forces unseen, the offspring of a deathless soul, can hew away to any goal, though walls of granite intervene. The human will that force unseen, the offspring of a deathless soul, can hew away to any goal, through walls of granite intervene. Your mind may be likened to a garden that may be intelligently cultivated or allowed to run wild, but whether cultivated or neglected, it must and will bring forth. If no useful seeds are put into it, then the abundance of useful weeds, useful, useless weeds, will soon fall therein, and will continue to produce their kind. Just as gardeners cultivate their plots, keep them free from weeds and growing in the flowing of the fruits that they desire, you must tend to the garden of your mind, weeding out all the wrong, useless, and impure thoughts, cultivating towards perfection in the flowers and the fruits of right, useful, and pure thoughts. By pursuing this process, you will sooner or later discover that you are a master, a gardener of your soul, the director of your life. You also reveal within yourself that the laws of thought and understand within every increasing increasing accuracy how to force of thought and elements of the mind operate into the shaping of your character circumstances and destiny thought and character are one and character can only manifest and discover itself through environment and circumstance the outer condition of your life will always be found to be harmoniously related to your inner state this does not mean that your circumstances at any given time are an indication of the entire character but that those circumstances are so intimate intimately connected with your vital element of your thought and that for the time being they are indispensable to your development you are where you are by the law of your being the thoughts that you have built into your character have been bought and have brought you there in this arrangement of your life there is no element of chance 
but it is also a result of law that cannot, that cannot err. This is just as true for those who feel out of harmony with their surroundings as those who are connected to them and those who are contented with them. As a progressive and evolving being, you are where you are in order to learn and grow. As you learn the spiritual lessons in any circumstances contains that contains for you, it passes away and gives you place to other circumstances. You are buffeted and buffeted by circumstances as long as you believe in yourself to be a creature affected by outside conditions. But when you realize that you are a creature of power and that you can command the hidden soil and seeds of being out of which your circumstances grow, then you become a rightful master of yourself. All people who have practiced self-examination, self-control, know the circumstances grow out of thought. Circumstances grow out of thought. For they have noticed that the alterizations of their circumstances have been the direct proportion to their altered mental conditions. So true is this, that when you earnestly apply yourself to remedy of the defects in your character, you make swift and marked progress and pass rapidly through the series of changes. The soul attracts from which it secretly harbors what it loves and also what it fears. In the reaches of the height of the cherished aspiration, then it falls to the depths of reoccurring examined fears. Circumstances are the means by which the soul receives its own. Every thought seed sown allowed to fall into the mind, and also to take root there, produces its own, blossoms sooner or later into an act, bearing its own fruits in opportunity and circumstance. Good thoughts bear good fruit, bad thoughts bear bad fruit. The outer world of the circumstances shapes itself into the inner world of thought, and both pleasant and unpleasant external conditions are factors from which it makes the ultimate good of the individual. As the reaper of your own harvest, you learn both the suffering and the bliss. Following the innermost desires, aspiration, thoughts from which you allow yourself to be dominated, you at last arrive at their fruit and fulfillment in the outer conditions of your life. The laws of growth and adjustment apply everywhere. A person does not end up in the gutter or in prison by tyranny or fate or circumstances, but by the path of low thoughts and base desires. Nor does a pure-minded person fall suddenly into crime or stress from merely external forces. The criminal thought had had long secretly fostered in this in his heart, and the hour of opportunity revealed its gathered power. Circumstances does not make the person. It reveals the person to himself or herself. No such conditions can exist and lead us and descend into a vice of attending sufferings apart from our own vicious inclinations, just as no such conditions can exist that lead us to ascend into virtue or success and its pure happiness without the continued cultivation of virtuousness, successful aspirations. We, therefore, as the lords of the masters of our thoughts, are the makers of ourselves and the shapers and the authors of our own environment. At birth, the soul comes into its own through every step of the earthly pilgrimage and it attracts those combinations of con conditions that reveal itself. That there are reflections of its own purity and impurity and strengths and weaknesses. We do not attract what we want, but we, what we attract for what we are. Our whims, fancies and ambitions are thwarted in every step, but our innermost thoughts and desires are fed from their own food. To be good or bad, the divinity that shapes our ends is in ourselves and it is our very self. And it is our very self. And so we are held prisoners by ourselves. Our own thoughts and actions are the jailers or of our fate. They imprison or they are our base. And they also are the angels of our freedom. They liberate us if they are noble. So we don't get what we wish or pray for, but we get what we justly earn. Our wishes and prayers are only gratified and answered when we have harmonized with our thoughts and actions. In the light of truth, what then is the meaning of frightful or frightening against circumstances in our lives? It means that we are continually revolting against the effect without, while all the time in a nourishing or preserving the cause in our hearts. That cause may take a form of conscious vice and unconscious weakness, but whatever it is, it stubbornly retards the efforts of its possessor and calls aloud for a remedy. Most of us are anxious to improve our circumstances, but are unwilling to improve ourselves, and we are therefore remain bound. If we do not shrink from honest self-examination that we can never fail to accomplish the object of our hearts that we set upon, this is true in earthly things as it is of heavenly things. Even if our sole object is to acquire wealth, we must be prepared to make great personal sacrifices before we can accomplish our object. And how much more so for those of us who would realize a strong and well-poised life. Let's look at some examples. Here are some people who are wretchedly poor and they're extremely anxious in their surroundings and home comforts should be improved, yet all the time they shirk their work. They consider that they're just justified and justified in trying to do or deceive their employees because of the insufficiencies of their wages. These people do not understand the simple basic principle that are the basics and true prosperity, that they are only totally unfit to rise out of their own poor conditions, but are actually attracting to themselves still worse conditions by dwelling in it and acting out weak, lazy, deceptive thoughts.